You may remember Chris Gardner from the movie The Pursuit of Happiness starring Will Smith. If so, you already know the story. He was a single father who pulled himself out of homelessness to become a millionaire stockbroker. But of course, like any movie based on a true story, it is going to have some parts that only gloss over the events of a person's life. And in today's biographics, we want to tell you the true rags to riches story of Chris Gardner. In order to understand how Chris Gardner found the strength to pull himself out of poverty and go on to become a millionaire, you need to know the story of how he was raised. His mother was Betty Jean Gardner, and she grew up in a very poor community in the state of Louisiana. In the 1940s, there were very few opportunities for black people outside of working on a farm. Betty wanted to get out of her small town and move on to bigger and better things. She studied very hard and graduated third in a high school class. Her goal was to go to college and become a full-time school teacher. Unfortunately, her parents could not afford to pay her tuition. Betty got a job as a substitute teacher at the local school instead. This is where she met the man of her dreams, Samuel Salter. He was handsome, college educated, and great with kids. The only problem? He was already married. But he told her that he loved her, and he planned to leave his wife so that he could marry her. Betty kept their relationship a secret, of course, and when she was 22, she got pregnant with Salter's child. Suddenly, the situation became all too real, and he backed out on his promise to leave his wife. Betty's parents, they were ashamed, and they refused to help her keep the baby. All of Betty's brothers had already moved to Milwaukee. New factories were opening on a regular basis, and there were plenty of blue-collar job opportunities. Therefore, she moved there to live with them. She gave birth to her daughter, Ophelia, and began her life as a single mum. But unfortunately, she didn't know that the man she was about to fall in love with would lead to heartbreak yet again. She had an affair with Thomas Turner, who was Chris's biological father, and he also refused to leave his wife to be with her. Chris was born in 1954, and Betty was raising her two children alone. She finally decided it was time to date a single man who would be devoted to her. So she married a man named Freddie Triplett, who was very tall and muscular. In his autobiography, Chris Gardner writes that Freddie was a frightening-looking giant, and he cannot even fathom why his mother chose to be with him. He was illiterate, with only a third-grade education. He was also an alcoholic and had a violent temper. He would beat Betty, and he would beat the children, as well as pick up his shotgun and threaten to shoot them. Betty had previously been on welfare, but she took on two jobs in order to earn enough money to leave Freddy behind. When he found out about her plan, he reported to social services that she was working and should no longer qualify for welfare. However, this is a pretty serious crime because it's welfare fraud. The police, they showed up to arrest Betty, and they didn't care that she was pregnant with her daughter Sharon. She spent the next three years in jail. Freddie refused to take care of Ophelia and Chris, so they grew up in a foster home. Baby Sharon was born in prison, and Freddie's mother agreed to care for her. When Betty was eventually released, she regained custody of Chris and Ophelia. Unfortunately, though, Betty fell into the cycle of abuse. Freddie apologized and promised to change, so they got back together. But, of course, he continued to beat her and the children. Betty knew that Freddie would never stop, so she burned down the house while he was asleep inside it in an attempt to kill him. Chris would later say, I can say honestly, I'm sorry she didn't succeed. But Freddy survived, and Betty ended up going to jail for a second time for the arson. Chris and his siblings grew up being raised in various relatives' houses around Milwaukee. Most of his childhood was spent playing unsupervised in the streets. He became the target of a child predator, and he was raped. For some people, this would have been enough to destroy them, but Chris pushed down the trauma and he tried to move forward. Later in life, he saw that same man again and he picked up a nearby cinder block and smashed his rapist's head in with it and left him there to bleed. When Betty was released from prison, she made sure to instill her love of education into her children. She would take Chris to the public library and she would tell him that everything he would ever want to know was contained within the walls of the library. This felt somewhat magical to him, and he excelled in school. Even though all of Betty's dreams had been crushed, she was never pessimistic, and she encouraged her own children to succeed. In his autobiography, Chris Gardner writes that there were two defining moments that led to his success. When he was 16 years old, he was watching a March Madness NBA game and sighed, saying out loud to himself, one day those guys are going to make a million dollars. His mother overheard him and said, son, if you want to, one day you can make a million dollars. For the first time in his life, he felt like he had permission to succeed. He had no idea how he would become a millionaire, but he knew that he wanted to make it happen. Mm -hmm. 
Since his mother could not afford to help him go to college, Chris Gardner was willing to go wherever he needed in order to pull himself out of his poverty. He joined the Navy after high school and spent four years serving as a medic. He was stationed at a Marine Corps base in North Carolina. During this time, he met a cardiac surgeon named Dr. Robert Ellis, who offered him a medical research position at the University of California Medical Center in the Veterans Hospital in San Francisco. After two years, he became the manager of the medical laboratory and co-authored several research papers with Dr. Ellis. On June 18, 1977, he married a woman named Sherry Dyson. She was a maths teacher from Virginia. When they first got married, Chris had plans to spend the next 10 years of his life working in the lab while putting himself through medical school. However, the medical field was beginning to change, and it was becoming more and more expensive to enter the profession than ever before. He decided that he would rather find a job that made money right away instead of spending so many years in school and then hoping to get a payoff later. Sherry Dyson was disappointed that Chris was giving up his dream of becoming a doctor. Their relationship was also falling apart, and he ultimately met and fell in love with a dental student named Jackie Medina. Only three months into their affair, Jackie became pregnant with their child. In 1980, Chris left his wife, and he began living with his girlfriend Jackie so that they could raise their son together. Throughout his childhood, Chris's stepfather, Freddie Triplett, would always tell him, I ain't your daddy, while holding a shotgun to his head. Chris grew up wondering who his biological father actually was. He swore to himself that someday he would be the opposite of his stepfather. He wanted to become the best father he could be, and he would never abandon or abuse his own child. At first, they were a happy family, and they were optimistic about their future. But when Jackie graduated from dental school, she failed her board exams, which meant that she could not work as a dentist. She was forced to give up her dreams and become a stay-at-home mum. The rent in San Francisco it was too expensive for Jackie and Chris to pay on a single income, so they had to move outside of the city. The research position at the hospital had only paid $7,500 a year, which was hardly enough to support Jackie and his son. He found a higher-paying job selling medical supplies to doctors in the Bay Area. He was now making $25,000 a year, and men who were higher up in the same industry made about $80,000 a year. But to put that in perspective with modern inflation, this was like leaving a $23,000 per year salary for a $76,000 per year job with the potential to make $244,000. Chris Gardner had everything going for him, and his dream of becoming a millionaire it seemed ever closer. But this all changed when he was 26 years old. Chris was leaving his job and was in the parking lot of the hospital. A man driving a red Ferrari was circling the parking lot and looking for a spot. He wore a suit, a tie, a watch, and he clearly looked incredibly successful. Chris waved the man down and said that he could have his parking space in exchange for information. He asked, what do you do and how do you do it? The man told him that he was a stockbroker, and they agreed to meet for coffee the next day. He learned that the man's name was Bob Bridges, and he gave Chris the rundown on the very basics of the stock market. This man was making $80,000 a month, and that's all Chris needed to hear. He decided that his new dream was to become a stockbroker. But even back then, most trading firms required at minimum an MBA before they would even consider hiring a rookie stockbroker. But he continued to spend more and more time essentially apprenticing at Bob Bridges' firm. You see, most of the skills needed in the stock market, they learned on the job and not in school, so Chris was learning how it could be possible for him to make a tremendous amount of money if only he was given the opportunity to work for a firm. Bob Bridges helped him secure interviews with various investment firms that offered training programs, but they kept saying no. To make matters worse, he racked up parking tickets every time he went on an interview. Now, this might sound like a trivial detail right now, but those parking tickets, they came back to bite him in a big way. Years later, Chris Gardner was asked if he thought racism had anything to do with the fact that it was so difficult to land a rookie position. He said, absolutely not. Think about it. I had never gone to college. Who's going to do business with you? That's placism. It could affect anybody in this room. But I kept coming back. Jackie wasn't convinced. From her perspective, Chris was skipping out on sales calls to chase after a pipe dream. She called him delusional and was frustrated and angry that he was neglecting his real job. In her defense, she had very good reasons to be concerned, and she already knew from her failure what it was like to work hard towards something for years, only to have it fall apart in the end. Despite the fact that she did not believe in him, Chris continued to learn, and he interviewed at as many firms as he could. After an entire year, he was offered a chance to join an unpaid internship position to become an entry-level trainee. There was no guarantee that he would even get the trainee job. If he did, he would be taking a huge pay cut compared to what he made as a medical supply salesman. The one major difference was, of course, that as a stockbroker, there is no ceiling on how much money you can make, 
and Chris wanted to be a millionaire. Finally, after trying and failing for over a year, Chris had got accepted into the training program of a firm called E.F. Hutton. He quit his job as a medical supply salesman because he was confident that things were only going to go up from there. Tragically, though, just a week later, when he showed up for the first day of the job, there was a new hiring manager working at E.F. Hutton. They looked at his resume and they retracted the job offer. Just like that. In an instant, Chris's life began to crumble. He had to go home to tell Jackie that he quit his sales job and he wasn't going to work for E.F. Hutton either. She was upset, but he tried his best to make ends meet. He began to get odd jobs like cutting lawns and continued to work towards becoming a stockbroker. But he and Jackie, they began to get into a lot more arguments. One day, during a particularly bad fight, their neighbors called the police because they believed that it may escalate into domestic violence. When the police officer checked his record, he saw that Gardner had racked up $1,200 in unpaid parking tickets. He did not have the ability to pay them, so he was taken to jail and held for 10 days. During those 10 days, all he could think about was his son. He didn't want his little boy to believe that his father had left him. He was scheduled to show up for another job interview on the ninth day, 24 hours before he was set to be released. He figured that he would never make it and that that would be the end of his dream, but he asked the police officer if he could make a phone call to reschedule the appointment. Technically, he was not allowed to make a second phone call, but the officer broke the rules and let him do it. He later stated of this, Nothing will ever convince me that it was anything other than the hand of God. Chris was released from prison the next morning at 6 a.m. and he rushed home to his apartment to take a shower and get a suit on before the interview. By the time he got there, Jackie had cleared out the apartment and their bank accounts. She had taken everything but the dust. Most importantly, she had taken my little boy. He was forced to show up at his interview at Dean Witter Reynolds wearing the same clothes that he had been arrested in 10 days earlier. Miraculously, he got accepted into the training program. When Jackie left him, she also took all of the money that they'd been saving for rent, so Chris, he was kicked out of his apartment. He continued earning a very small amount of money from cutting grass and painting, which was enough to pay for a single room in a boarding house. He began going to his training program during the day to take classes and only coming back to the tiny room to go to sleep. Just three months after leaving him, Jackie returned to find Chris. She realized that she didn't want to be a single mother and she wanted to try and rebuild her medical career. So she asked Chris to take their son. He gladly took Chris Jr. back and agreed to take sole custody of him while Jackie moved on with her life and never looked back. However, the boarding house it did not allow children and they forced them to leave. Many of the men's homeless shelters they wouldn't accept children either or they would fill up too quickly before he was able to receive any food or shelter. Chris never panhandled and he tried his best to hide the fact that he was homeless. He always wore a suit and pushed his son around in the stroller. To most people passing on the street, they would assume he was just another father going somewhere. However, the local sex workers, they took notice to Chris walking through the ghetto the same time every night and figures what was going on. These ladies of the night, they would slip $5 bills to his toddler, Chris Jr. Their kindness, together with his work mowing lawns on the weekends, was just enough money to help them survive. Even then, though, they barely held on by a threat. Gunner said, It was a choice. Do we eat or stay in a hotel? We chose to eat. Chris was always on the move, and they would find places to sleep wherever they could. Sometimes friends would let them sleep on their couch. Other times, when he worked late into the night at the firm, he and his son would hide under his desk to sleep in the office. When there was no other option, Chris would lock them in a subway station bathroom. They were able to clean themselves in the bathroom sink and lay down on the floor to sleep. When he closed his eyes, he still dared to dream of wearing a new suit and driving a red Ferrari. In one of his darkest moments, Chris was feeling completely overwhelmed and had an incredible amount of self-doubt. He had to give his son a bath by candlelight because there was no electricity where they were staying. Just when he felt ready to give up, his son said, You know what? You're a good papa. This was enough to keep him going. Chris began going to church to listen to a man named Reverend Cecil Williams speak on Sunday mornings. Chris was standing in food lines, and the reverends couldn't help but notice him because there were countless homeless single mothers, but he was the only single father. Cecil Williams had a program for these mothers at the Glide Memorial Methodist Church. Once Chris found out about the program, he asked the reverend if he could make an exception and let them in. So he did. Finally, Chris Garner and his son, they had a place where they knew they were guaranteed to have a roof over their head. After this year-long unpaid internship, Chris Gardner passed his Series 7 exam and officially became a stockbroker. He got a job at the San Francisco-based firm Bear Stearns & Company. He was finally paid a base salary of $1,000 a month, which is $2,354 after modern inflation. It was enough for Chris to start renting a studio apartment for himself and his son. And with that, they were no longer homeless. 
But of course, it didn't stop there. Now that he finally had his opportunity to work in that field, Chris Gardner completely devoted his life to becoming the best stockbroker he could possibly be. He showed up early, he stayed late, and worked ten times harder than anyone else. In 1987, he began another nearly impossible dream by starting his own firm called Gardner Rich & Co. with just $10,000 of his own money. Through hard work and persistence, he was able to gather up clients until his firm was incredibly successful. Today, he has an estimated net worth of $60 million. And yes, eventually he did buy a Ferrari, but this wasn't just any Ferrari. This was a Testarossa that belonged to Michael Jordan. Gardner changed the license plate to say, not MJ. Chris Gardner wrote his autobiography called The Pursuit of Happiness, and it became a bestseller. In 2006, a movie version of his life was made starring Will Smith. After the movie was complete, Smith and his wife were so moved by the story that they decided to donate $75,000 to the homeless shelter run by Reverend Cecil Williams. Chris Gardner continues to volunteer at the soup kitchen, as well as give financial donations. After the premiere of the movie in 2006, the United States entered the financial crisis just two years later. For years, there was this stigma that people only became homeless if they were mentally ill or drug addicts. But the recession taught us that in a time of crisis, it can truly happen to anyone, even if they did everything right in their lives. The movie of Chris Gardner's life it began to resonate with people years beyond the movie's initial release, and he has been invited to speak to help inspire people at countless public events. In 2010, Chris Gardner said during a speech, we have, in fact, seen the creation of a whole new class of homeless, something I call white-collar homeless. Went to school, played by the rules, colored within the lines, then the world changes. Just like that. If we learn anything from the story of Chris Gardner, it's that bad luck could make things in our lives completely fall apart. Maybe we won't hit absolute rock bottom, but life happens, whether we're ready for it or not. And no matter how many times we've fumbled, it's still possible to pull ourselves back up and keep going towards our dreams, no matter how crazy they might seem. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. I hope you found it inspiring. If you haven't seen The Pursuit of Happiness, highly recommended. Definitely check that out or check out some of my other videos. You'll find those linked to on the screen now. And as always, thank you for watching.